Hi, this is Paul Conway, and welcome to the preface session of the Global Summit. During this session, you'll hear from a number of different experts who, in each of their capacities, have seen the growing interest and demand for an international consortium of patient consumers who are focused on helping others that are involved in innovation drive solutions to the patient community. One of our first speakers is Foko Weyringer. And Foko is the principal scientist at the IMEC in the Netherlands. He's an engineer by training, but most importantly to us, he's a very strong patient advocate and a friend. His engineering solutions and background have him very focused on the role that patients have in developing the solutions that they will benefit from. He believes in human factors engineering, or more simply put, putting the patient at the center of the solutions that folks are working on so that they make sense and that they're readily adopted once they become available. He has got a great sense of humor, very strong opinions. Here in the United States, he has been an influential voice in the Kidney Health Initiative, which is a formal partnership between the United States Food and Drug Administration and the world's largest nephrology society, the American Society of Nephrology, one of our allied organizations. Again, Foco is a good friend and somebody who brings a very unique perspective to the pursuit for innovations and treatments on a timely basis for patients who suffer. He's one of, one of the greatest friends we have in the kidney community. Foco? Well, thanks for that nice intro, and I hope I will not disappoint you. So here we go. Today, I'm here to talk about how we in Europe joined AAKP's Decade of the Kidney. And with we, I mean the European Kidney Health Alliance, the Dutch Kidney Foundation, and IMEC, where I also work. Now, let me first introduce the European Kidney Health Alliance, which is for all kidney health stakeholders that are not for profit in Europe. That consists of patients, nephrologists, healthcare workers and researchers who all jointly advise the European Commission. It's more or less the equivalent of what you have in the US, the excellent, you know, kidney caucus from the US Congress. You may recognize something there. You say, wait a minute, that looks like kidney health initiative that you have in the US. And that's totally true. The European Kidney Health Alliance and Kidney Health Initiative are more or less twin sisters or at least very close to it. And uh, I like these cartoon series, by the way, uh, these two sisters who all do kind of research as since we work on the same problems, we'd better work together. And that is why we joined the decade of the kidney from AAKP, because that is the perfect vehicle in which patients worldwide unite on that is what interesting the most, namely how to get better treatments and how to get better prevention on kidney disease. It's a wonderful, wonderful initiative of AAKP. And now the Dutch Kidney Foundation. I promise to introduce you to that as well. Well, the Dutch Kidney Foundation has a kind of a head start with kidney foundations because dialysis started in the Netherlands. In 1945, Dutch Dr. Kolf invented the first hemodialysis machine that actually was clinically usable. And he treated the first patient that survived acute kidney injury. And that was quite special because it was a miracle in those days if you would awake from a uremic coma. But if we look upon all kinds of artificial hearts and eyes and hips and hands and ears, what happened? The artificial kidney is still extremely big. And Kolf wanted it to make it small, wearable, maybe even implantable, just as he did with the artificial heart. You can see him on this photograph holding the first artificial heart that was actually implanted into a patient, and that really worked. So that was another invention of this wonderful man who got the name Father of in Artificial Organs. And there will be another speaker today telling more about that. So this wonderful invention of dialysis was made in 1945. And here we see a cartoon that we, as the European Kidney Health Alliance, uh, gave out on World Kidney Day this year. So what happened? Well, 50 years of adding smartness into nearly everything. But somehow in the 70s, the roaring speed of innovation grinded more well to a halt, I wouldn't say, but it, it slowed down considerably. So whereas in 1971, people really would say, well, in 10 years, dialysis will be portable. 
Now look what happened to the guy. If we look upon beyond the curtains, if we look upon what stayed the same, it is being tied to the wall. The machines have been in, improved, that's true, but they're still big and they're still tied to the wall. They need a lot of water and they need a big drain and they need a lot of electrical power and a grounded powered outlet. Even though the guy got a smart toilet and he can order the toilet paper if it's out of, delivered by a drone, drone automatically and his vacuum cleaner is a robot, his machine is more or less for him the same. So how can we do something about that? Well, so far, dialysis is, you know, asking from the patients to schedule their lives around their therapies. But we want to do it different with the Dutch Kidney Foundation. So we want to schedule the treatment around the life of the patient. And for that, we think that patients should be able to do it at home, but also be able to travel. And the only thing that ties this machine to the wall is the plug, the power plug, but it will work from a three amp fuse, which is very low. It will work in the US, Japan, in Europe, no matter where. And it will not need a drain and it will not need a water connection. And the plug does not even have to be grounded. You see that small suitcase standing there? Well, that's still fitting the carry on luggage um, requirements. And you know, it'll fit in there because you can fold it a little bit back. And that is just the first step. The first step, because what we have done is we recognize the great initiative of the Kidney Health Initiative to write a roadmap, a technology innovation roadmap to describe how we could come from what we are now, where we are now, until, for instance, an implantable artificial kidney. Sounds like science fiction, but I tell you, the science is much more than the fiction. And we, we were so happy that we could join from Europe to join and, and write on that technology roadmap, which was presented in Washington here with a, a great bunch of great people and always patients present. And AAKP played a big role in that, have to be acknowledged. So, okay, road mapping, you, Dr. Wieninger claims that is, that's beneficial. What the heck is road mapping? Well, graphically summarizing this, this guy shows a 1970s big mainframe computer and says, someday you'll be able to hold one of these in the palm of your hand while you poop. And you know what? It actually is, has come true because nowadays, uh, you, you can hold your phone in your hand and do whatever you want. I'm not arguing with that. But your cell phone holds way much more computing power than the entire Apollo program. But fortunately for you, it costs only a fraction. And that comes through the power of road mapping, where industry is agreeing upon milestones. And although direct, direct competitors in the market, realizing that to realize those technologies, step by step, you need to work together to get it done. That has happened in semiconductor industry. And that's why all these electronic stuff that the, the, the guy in the previous cartoon had is actually come true for a low price. What does iMac do? Because I promised to introduce you to three things. Huh? Well, iMac is basically exploring the power of road mapping in semiconductor industry. We are a not-for-profit research hub for nanotechnology, and we push the limits of what can be done on chip. And just to graphically illustrate this, look upon this nurse in 1962, a miracle of the world, an ECG monitor. That was great. It worked. It was, it was heavy, I can tell you. And, you know, it was a bit uh, non -support, not supportable. When I started working in hospital, in 1986, um, this was the most modern monitor that we had, and it could measure ECG and respiration. Why it, it weighed less, it was more compact and much more reliable. But you now look upon, from that moment on, chips starting to become more and more integrated. In 2016, iMac made a chip of one square centimeter, which could measure ECG, bioimpedance spectroscopy, and SpO2 plus respiration. You know what? Only five years later, the chip is four times as small, but does more than double of the functions. And that is the power of road mapping, you know, making it smaller, making it cheaper and making it more performance 
on a square millimeter. That's what Moore law, Moore's law is about. And with this experience in pushing roadmaps, we think that if we transfer that experience also to the kidney roadmap, that'll certainly help to push things forward. So what we think might be the future is that we can help to make artificial kidneys really go back into the body where you would like to have them to carry them around so that the blood connection is actually in your body and that means the risk of infection is much lower that your heart will be the blood pump that is pumping around and although there are groups that already do that eh, which we which we really applaud we can add some smartness into those devices so what we think is that with the groups that are actually in the us by the way do we have a great job on making the membranes and, and the, the, the parts of the engine that will function as an artificial kidney we can add smartness with electronics on that to do wonderful extra things like wireless connection wireless communication and charging um measuring the diverse parameters in the body like core body temperature well if you're in the body core body temperature is easy to measure anyhow fluid state is monitoring real time all the time and also um, have ways to better remove protein bound toxins for instance and that is not science fiction it's science and it can be done and it can be even done with very very small chips that could be compatible with the ongoing projects that are already targeting artificial kidneys will it be easy no but you you know your president kennedy once said we're not doing this because it's easy we're doing this because we think it must be done and that is indeed what i i see with all the patients the decade of the kidney huh, is is this ambitious thing let's do this and combine science and technology from different sites putting it all in, in a take home message well let's combine our individual puzzle pieces of technology and knowledge and join the decade of the kidney to puzzle around until we finally have a much better kidney replacement therapy that will be cheaper, that will be more efficient and give patients much more freedom to move around. And if anybody wants to talk about that topic, you're totally welcome. And my contact details are in that slide. Thank you very much for your attention. It was a pleasure and an honor to be asked for this great AAKP Congress. Thank you, Foco, my friend, for your great presentation. Now I'd like to throw a question at you. Can you tell me how, as an engineer, and as somebody who draws from many different disciplines as a professional, a patient-consumer consortium around the world can be supportive for your efforts, and just as importantly, how patient consumers in a consortium that's global can help political leaders, help folks like you who are engineering the solutions for kidney diseases? Well, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, in fact, two questions, and I think they're, they're the core. They are really the core and the key to innovation. Well, you know, a global patient consumer consortium will really have a, a, a voice that cannot be ignored by the decision makers upon research uh, resources. And those, of course, are uh, politicians that determine how we are going to address the future questions. And policymakers, since this is a global problem, I mean, kidney health is really a global problem. So it would be logical that policymakers from around the world would indeed also unite, like, like uh, ECHA and KHI also say, since we're working on the same problems, we better work together. Same thing for the politicians that are working on this. And so I think it's a wonderful idea that patients would be engaged in that discussion and they will give you useful information because they know how it is and they know what they would need in their daily life. So it's an excellent idea. And it's an honor and a pleasure to introduce now the next speaker, which is Hilde Voutmans, and she's a member of the European Parliament, a very active member, because she chairs a group of 20 European Parliament members that are concerned with kidney health, really driven people. 
And this so-called MAP group for kidney health is the European equivalent of your great US bipartisan congressional kidney caucus. Uh, Mrs. Voutman is a driven patient advocate. Uh, she knows what she's talking about and well aware of the need for more innovation in the kidney field. I think you will enjoy her talk and you have to remember, she's a deputy coordinator of the Committee on Foreign Affairs of Renew Europe. So who knows? And listen to her while she's talking about innovation in the kidney field. Dear members of the US Congressional Kidney Caucus, my name is Hilde Voitmans. I'm a member of the European Parliament and the chair of the MEP Group for Kidney Health. We are all here, be it this time virtually, for the same reason. I don't have to tell you how much of an impact chronic kidney disease can have on someone's life. Every year, millions of people are diagnosed with some form of chronic disease. For many, this is the start of a long journey of struggling, falling and trying to get up over and over again and again. Also for relatives and loved ones, this battle is difficult. And I can speak from experience here. But I'm an optimist who believes in progress and change. That's the reason why I became a politician in the first place. Change is possible. And I believe that when I say that things will get better, they will. But we can and have to act more in Europe, but also in the United States. I always say we need more awareness, more funding and more innovation. Today, I want to add a fourth element and that's cooperation. Because as we all are aware and all are witnessing, diseases know no borders. So let's work together. Also history has shown that cooperation plays a key role in innovation. Do you know the success story of the first hemodialysis treatment ever? I'll tell you. 75 years ago, not in the United States, but in Europe. During World War II, Dutch doctor Willem Kolf was the first one to manage it. While hiding the, this project for the Nazi occupants, he built a dialyzed machine from sausage skin, a bath tube, a sewing machine motor, a Model T Ford water pump and an aluminum plate from a shutdown plane. Isn't that incredible? After demonstrating that hemodialysis really works, Dr. Kolf built four additional machines at his own cost and sent them as a gift to Poland, England, Canada and the United States of America. In 1950, he immigrated to the United States to work on artificial organs and led the team in UTEC that developed the first artificial heart that was successfully implanted in a human. In 1960, a doctor from Seattle added another crucial ingredient to hemodialysis, a reusable blood excess which made long-term chronic hemodialysis possible. A great example of how technologies from two continents jointly saved many people. But as we all know, although life-saving dialysis is not the ultimate and final therapy, as it remains associated with high mortality, a relatively poor quality of life, and it's very expensive, we really need better and more innovative technologies. So I believe I can say that still today, we share a common goal on both sides of the Atlantic. We must further improve the life of people with kidney disease. The inventions of Dr. Kolf form an indisputable proof that international cooperation can work miracles to save and improve the lives of millions of people. That's why I'm proud to offer this book, telling 
the amazing life story of Dr. Koff, to all members of the U.S. Congressional Kidney Caucuses and all the members of the MEP Group for Kidney Health. Together, we can and will revive the innovative spirit in the fight against kidney disease. Together, we can make this coming decade the decade of the kidney. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Foco, for your presentation and for answering my question. And a really tremendous thank you to Hilde Voltman from the European Union, who joined us today because of her belief that patient collaboration and a patient consortium that's global and focused on driving innovation to help battle kidney diseases is worth her time and the time of elected leaders and appointed leaders worldwide. Her message is very strong and should be further evidence for everyone watching our global summit that the interests for kidney patients are at every level of society, but especially among political leaders here in the United States, in Europe, and in other countries. Hilde has been a very strong champion of AAKP's efforts to partner with patient organizations in the European Union, and she has been a very strong and effective voice for innovation and the support of innovation through regulatory and payment policies. Both FOCO and Hilde have invested a great deal of time and effort in supporting patients and patient-centered medicine. So has our next guest, a very strong patient advocate, Dr. Murray Sheldon. Murray Sheldon is unique. His voice is quite strong here in the United States and around the world because he brings with him the expertise, not only of a heart surgeon, but also as somebody who has started a company and somebody who advises policy leaders at the most senior levels in the Food and Drug Administration, the center of so much innovation, science, and regulatory policy. Dr. Sheldon has been a longtime friend of AAKP and patients throughout the world and here in the US. His voice is strong because it's based on idealism and principle, and the principle being this, that no patient should have to suffer while governments or industry try to work out the minutia of regulatory policy. He has a sense of urgency and a sense of fairness, and he's dedicated to safely bringing new products and innovations into the space for patients who are suffering to make certain that we have the solutions that we need to live and to pursue our aspirations. Again, it's a great honor to have Dr. Sheldon with us. We appreciate his time. Dr. Sheldon? Hello, I'm Dr. Murray Sheldon. I'm very, very pleased and honored that AAKP has allowed me to participate in this really wonderful educational seminar, webinar, um, to talk about uh, patient involvement with international cooperation to create an implantable artificial kidney. Just to give you a little background as to uh, who I am, uh, for many years I practiced uh, cardiac surgery in California and um, eventually began developing medical devices. And I did that locally in California and then around the world, mostly in Europe for about 10 years and was eventually recruited to join the FDA in 2012. So I've been at the FDA for nearly 10 years now and I'm the Associate Director for Technology and Innovation and one of my primary jobs is to identify areas that have lack of innovation, identify the root causes of that and try to fix it and basically cut down barriers to innovation so that we can continue to improve uh, medical devices for patients with all sorts of illnesses. And in one particular area, that of kidney disease, especially end-stage uh, kidney disease, we've had a huge lack of innovation for maybe 60, 70 years. So that's been a focus of my work for the last five years. And I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about some of the things that we're working on to improve the ability to create products for patients with end-stage uh, kidney disease. Why are we focusing on treatment for end-stage uh, kidney disease? By the way, th this slide's a little bit old. It has ESRD, that's end-stage renal disease. Uh, there's been a movement 
the to change the word renal to kidney that means the same thing but it's a little bit more understandable uh kidney disease so um wh why are we focused on that well first of all most people understand that people with end-stage kidney disease have a very poor quality of life and limited ex life expectancy as a matter of fact when you look at five-year mortality for people with end-stage kidney disease uh, on a variety of treatments, and I've put an arrow by hemodialysis, and uh, the next red line is peritoneal dialysis, and you get better mortality with um, uh, kidney transplants. But when you compare it to multiple cancers in blue, nearly every cancer except for uh, lung cancer and uh, GI cancers are, are worse than kidney disease. So essentially, your life expectancy with end-stage kidney disease is that of a very, very bad cancer. And it's very expensive. It's a very, very high cost to CMS. And as you notice in the slide below, it's not flat. It's rising. As a matter of fact, CMS is now spending in the United States about 8% of their budget on people's treatment with end-stage kidney disease. But the real reason for why are the people that are living with it. And the two photos, uh, the one of the gentleman sitting on the river is Bill Peckham. And Bill Peckham is pretty famous because he uh, has had kidney disease for most of his life, and he did not let it stop him. Um, and it's very difficult, but he dialyzes himself, and he's there on a river raft floating down the Colorado River in the Grand Canyon. Now, that's pretty amazing. Uh, unfortunately, the best dialyzer in the world passed away last year. So even if you're good at dialysis, you, you, your life expectancy is a problem. And the, the young boy next to him is a friend, Caleb, who I met uh, several years ago. Caleb was also born with kidney disease. Uh, he was fortunate enough to have kidney transplants. He's in fact had two kidney transplants and he's rejected both of them. And he now has sufficient number of antibodies uh, that he will never be able to get another kidney transplant. So he started on dialysis and he went through vascular access on one arm, then vascular access on another. And in this picture is when I last met him a few years ago, he was in Washington um, going to the operating room to get his first vascular access in one of his legs. So he's 16 years old in this picture now, and you, you just, you, your heart goes out to him. And that's why I want to focus on end-stage renal disease for Caleb and for Bill Peckham and for all the people who are suffering uh, with this um, very, very deadly condition that has very, have, has had very poor innovation over the years. And I think patients are really at the heart of what we do. And when you ask patients, and this is a survey that was conducted a few years ago about what aspects of kidney disease um, they would like to see developed, there's a number of things that were popped up, of course, improved vascular access, improved transplantation. But the number one list at the top, 72%, a next generation renal replacement therapy, such as a wearable or artificial implantable kidney. And it's, it's been my philosophy primarily to listen to patients and to understand what they need and to work with patients because they're the heart of what we do. It's not about the devices and it's not about what we do at FDA. It's about the patients, the people with the disease. And it's reality that partnerships are critical, but partnerships in this case needs to be more extensive than what we've ever had before. And it includes collaboration with governments, international governments, and everybody must work together but patient leadership is absolutely critical in making innovation in this area happen. And I'm, I'm just so thrilled that AAKP has really led the way with other patient organizations uh, to really uh, provide the leadership that's needed uh, to influence new innovation 
for people with end-stage kidney disease. This is a um, article that was uh, written by three different patients in three different areas, the U.S., uh, the Netherlands, and in Denmark. Uh, you can see the, the authors, and you can see what they have said, that the need for innovation in dialysis is long overdue, and there's no doubt that mainstay therapy for kidney failure dialysis has a negative impact on quality of life. And we don't want that to happen to our patients, and the time for complacency is over, and patients are demanding, and we need to be responsive to help create new approaches, innovative approaches, uh, to help these people like Caleb, like Bill Peckham. And if the patient communities lead, the rest of the communities will follow. This is a, a press release that was put out uh, by uh, the Kidney Health Initiative, which is a public-private partnership between the U.S. Uh, uh, Food and Drug Administration and the American Society for Nephrology. And we were recently, in 2019, given a grant to develop an initiative to understand patient preferences for novel kidney devices and to use that information in how we work. These papers have recently been published last month in April 2021 in the Clinical Journal of the American Society of Nephrology. And there are a group of five patients, uh, excuse me, five papers um, with an overview of the science of the components of patient input and how to develop valid scientific information from these surveys so that we can utilize the information. And we brought multiple groups together including the AAKP, as you can see, and we've utilized our colleagues at MIT that have incorporated Bayesian decision analysis to help understand the data. The um, folks at FDA who review innovative renal products um, and patient engagement were also involved, as well as the uh, Kidney Health Initiative to give an idea as to how we can best capture the patient information on a routine basis and then utilize that in how we move forward and create better innovation. So how do we get this done? I, I, I told you that I've developed medical products in the past and I'm, I'm not a seer, I, I can't predict the future, but based on my knowledge and what I've done in the past, I believe that it's that the development of an implantable artificial kidney is unlikely to follow the pattern of general medical de uh, device development. Um, and that's because it's much more complicated than anything we've done before. It will likely be a eventually a hybrid, um, a product that will require some sorts of uh, kidney cells and biologics, and that will make it very complex. And the various technologies um, are extremely great and risks for companies are enormous. And this is why we need to put all hands on deck, not just in the US. It's not a problem for, for our country alone. It's a worldwide problem and it's growing in other areas of the country. So we get this done, that, 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 that's the main question. How, how do we make this happen? And this slide just, um, puts out the notion through the um, uh, International Society of Nephrology that as we look to the future, it, what happens if we don't do it? We're looking at the leading causes of death in 2016, and you can see that chronic kidney disease is down at number 16. They anticipate that by 2040, it's going to jump up to number five. And the reason for this is emerging economies. As countries develop and as their economies improve and they um, change their lifestyles, diabetes and hypertension, high blood pressure becomes um, more prevalent within societies. And those are the leading causes of, of kidney disease, which results in end-stage renal disease, end-stage kidney disease that requires a treatment that for right now, we only have hemodialysis or kidney transplantation. And it's estimated that by 2030, by 10 years, 14 and a half million people will have that uh, problem, yet only a third 
will be able to be treated due to economic, social, and political factors. In addition, more than 2 million people will die each year with no access at all to hemodialysis or kidney transplantation. So that's the challenge if we continue on our current course. So we were very fortunate um, when President Trump was in office in uh, 2019 that he put out an executive order on the advancing American kidney health. And section six describes encouraging the development of an artificial kidney. And how are we gonna do that uh, by the government? Section A talks about um, that the FDA, um, the group that I work with, will put out information uh, that we are requesting pre-market approvals for wearable or implantable artificial kidneys and encourage their development and submission uh, to the Food and Drug Administration for clinical testing, and also to provide a strategy um, which we've created in, in the Kidney Innovation Accelerator, so-called Kidney X, to fund um, new research and new development. Um, the Kidney X is a new public-private partnership between the American Society of Nephrology and the Department of Health and Human Services. And we have run multiple Kidney X Prize competitions um, that have really yielded great benefits to date. Essentially, this is, um, I'm going to describe my vision for the development of an artificial uh, a kidney uh, through an international consortium that could be provided to people around the world free as a worldwide humanitarian effort for peace. And to do so, to bring in all the countries of the world, everybody should contribute what they have. Some nations will contribute scientific and bioengineering expertise or manufacturing expertise. Some nations who don't have some of that will contribute financial support. And it's all for Caleb and Bill Peckham. That's the reason for it. And we should develop multiple advanced manufacturing centers throughout the world capable of developing these products and then distributed to people in all of the countries that have participated in the development through an independent organization such as the World Health Organization or others. And we have examples on how this international cooperation can work. And the International Space Station is one with over 15 uh, countries working together with multiple launch sites, which would be like our manufacturing sites around the world and multiple organizations, all sharing their knowledge, their expertise, and their money to develop something for the benefit of mankind that everybody worldwide uh, can take advantage of and use. And we're already going down the road. What do we have already? Well, through the Kidney Health Initiative, we've developed a roadmap of how to go from here to there, and we use it as a catalyst for change. I mentioned Kidney X, which is to fund development through a series of prize competitions. But essentially, patient participation is the key driving factor and built on two of the Kidney X principles that it be patient driven and collaborative. And that's what is guiding how we're doing this. And uh, so far, we're on course um, to really make a major impact in innovation in this area. So what has been done so far? We've had development of uh, portable artificial kidneys to allow people to um, uh, travel. We've developed um, a, a new home hemodialysis uh, a device um, that enables people to get out of the clinics and to live uh, more comfortably at home. There have been uh, wearable artificial kidneys that's been developed by several uh, groups around the world with the help of, of our Kidney X uh, uh, funds, as well as others that enable people to dance and to travel and to wear all day long. A group in uh, San Francisco and in southern other areas are already developing a fully implantable bioengineered kidney that you can see an example of uh, there. And it's been tested in animals for up to 60 days and being very successful. There's been other approaches uh, to take a different animal's uh, kidney scaffolds. This you're seeing a pig 
that it was decellularized. All the pig cells was removed, but the scaffold was remained and re-infused with human uh, stem kidney cells uh, to produce a potentially uh, transplantable uh, human kidney. And there are groups around the world that have actually developed vascularized kidney organoids. Now what this is, and you can see the picture, it looks pretty much like our normal human kidney, but it's just a very small cell and then we need to develop them and to put them together and then get them into a bioreactor that can be implanted into people and do the work of a normal kidney. So with all of these advances, um, we think that there are real opportunities to really change the approach to uh, people with, with end-stage kidney disease. And patients have already been driving this, this collaboration, and we need to increase this. This is a little list of what AAKP has done. Um, they were, of course, a founding member of the Kidney Health Initiative back in 2012. And in, uh, the, in 2019, they launched a program called the Decade of the Kidney and had an inaugural global summit on uh, kidney disease that was looked at by over 20,000 uh, people live streamed in 50 countries around the world. Multiple partnerships have been developed through AAKP and they launched in 2020 a first international patient collaborative with um, a United Kingdom based uh, a kidney patient group called the Renal Patient Support Group. And they proposed in 2020 the International Consortium for Artificial Kidney at the second annual summit, which was live streamed to even more countries. And this year, um, they are now working with the European Kidney Patient Federation and European Kidney Health Alliance uh, to um, uh, expand this further through Europe. And that's exactly the type of collaboration that we really, really need across, we call the pond, um, the Atlantic Ocean, but it needs to go much beyond that. The European Union has taken this up um, with full speed ahead and uh, they have declared their own decade of the kidney in Europe with the EKHA um, as joining and linking up with the uh, AAKP's uh, approach for the uh, launching the decade of the kidney project. And this kind of shows a similar type of roadmap over the years as to how this development may occur um, from following the, the roadmaps that we've developed from initial uh, uh, production of uh, different components to new kidney therapies, um, extending home dialysis, developing an implantable kidney with the ultimate goal of actually regenerating uh, a full human kidney um, and really curing this problem. And this international cooperation is just getting started. And in March of this year, just a few months ago, the US and the EU have put out a, uh, uh, an announcement that has preceded this particular summit to let the world know that they are joining hands to really stimulate innovation for development of new products for people with end-stage kidney disease. The patients don't just stop at helping that. In a survey, patients were asked if they would share their data to help researchers and other companies develop uh, new products and new treatments, and 98%, 93% said yes. And that's just amazing uh, how much patients are um, willing to be helpful and to work together as a key component and, and, and this is why AAKP um, has done such a great job at making this possible. And so I'd just like to uh, end this talk with an old African proverb that you can see, if you want to go fast, you go alone, but if you want to go far, you go together. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to go together. And we want to go far and, and we want to be disruptive of the current treatment that we have right now, which is essentially dialysis, which as we mentioned earlier on, yields a poor quality of life and a very shortened life expectancy. And we don't just want to build another 
a better dialysis machine. When Henry Ford was asked what does uh, his customers want, he would say, well, they want a faster horse. No, we want something totally different, um, something that really can enable people to live a normal quality of life. And so we need to go together worldwide. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the AAKP for the opportunity of presenting this information uh, to all the listeners and for working with the patients to make this potential dream and this vision a reality so that we can reinvigorate innovation in the area of end-stage kidney disease for Caleb, for Bill Peckham, and for all the people worldwide who will need these new innovative products to lead a normal life. AKP, thank you. Listeners, thank you. I hope that we can work together in the future. Thank you very much, Dr. Sheldon, for taking time out of your schedule and that of the FDA. We know you're quite busy, and we always appreciate you joining the Global Summit. Our next guest, Jack Calavitrinas, is a veteran of two U.S. presidential administrations with substantial time spent at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the U.S. Department of Labor, and the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. He's the principal and founder of JK Consulting, and he's also a member of the APCO Worldwide International Advisory Council, an advisory council to one of the largest government affairs consulting firms that works with pharmaceutical and other industries, both here in the U.S. and across the globe. Jack will bring a special message to you from the perspective of somebody who's served in many different realms about the growing importance of patient insights and the history that patients bring when they enter into the policy arena in the kidney space and the principles that we honor by being active and raising our voice. Jack's perspective is interesting to us because he connects the dots that FOCO has raised, Hilde has raised as a government official, and that Dr. Sheldon has raised from his perspective, not just at the FDA, but also as an innovator. Jack, go right ahead. Paul, I really appreciate being here. I appreciate the AAKP and GW um, inviting me to be part of this really important panel and this unbelievable global summit that's occurring uh, during this, the decade of the kidney, which I just think is so, so wonderful to, uh, to have that name. You know, kudos for this kind of collaboration and a quick note, um, knowing you, Paul, a long time through our work together in, in government and in the private sector, and, you know, I have a personal connection to GW, both my father-in-law, uh, who's a native Washingtonian, and my brother-in-law both went to GW Medical School and very, very proud graduates, both uh, eye surgeons, and uh, heard a lot of wonderful things. And being a native Washingtonian myself, I know what a, a fine institution at GW is. Um, but we're, we're here to talk about uh, kidney health and talk about patient engagement. And... Um, you know, that's something that I can speak to because I had the wonderful opportunity to serve at HHS uh, twice in my career in two different administrations. The previous administration had a chance to work on the transition and immediately go uh, to the FDA before coming back to HHS. And that was a unique experience because I actually arrived there together with my colleague, uh, Anna Abram, uh, the two of us were the first two appointees. We were actually there before uh, Scott Gottlieb arrived. And I eventually became the Associate Commissioner of the Office of External Affairs. The thing about that office is a lot of people uh, who know it, know it because of its media relations role and because of the fact that it actually uh, runs the website and the social media accounts. And God knows there are a lot of Twitter accounts at, at the FDA. What people don't really realize is the history of the patient engagement aspect of that office. What I mean by that is that the patient programs and the patient engagement programs uh, have been run out of the Office of External Affairs for many, many years. In fact, the very first uh, patient engagement person and entity, um, and his name is Richard, he um, retired on my watch in 2017 after a long and illustrious career, but he was the first person at the FDA who would engage with the um, HIV and AIDS activists in uh, the 1980s. And through that open door and engagement uh, that was forged, 
uh, an office was created. And it's hard to believe now, but there was no office of, of patient engagement, making sure that the patient voice was heard throughout the department in the various centers. It was focused on that one important issue. But from that point on, moving into the 90s and moving into the 2000s, uh, actual programs were developed in order to uh, really listen to and make sure that patient voices were heard. It still was actually pretty um, minimal, I would say, until it became more bolstered through the Office of Constituent Affairs and the um, Office of Patient Programs was created. Um, and I'm very proud to say that in the uh, last administration, the patient liaison program really took off. And um, once the patient program at FDA uh, came to its full fruition, um, there was really full participation in the development of drugs, biologics, and medical devices at all levels. And I'm sure things are going to continue in the next couple of years to follow on the same path uh, that it had taken uh, when I was there, when regardless of, of where the office was physically located, the fact is that was that the office of the commissioner was very, very mindful of the importance, and not just the office of the commissioner, but the center directors, each of whom actually created their own patient offices. But it's one thing to have an office, it's another to really understand that the voice of patients who are suffering from various uh, disease states and all actually also having the data that is developed. Oftentimes it's outside groups such as AAKP who provide very important data to NIH and to uh, the FDA. Back to AAKP, I am just so impressed uh, in talking to you, Paul, uh, and just doing my own research that the partnerships you've created with your colleagues in, in Europe and the EU the nine partnerships that were recently um, unveiled. And I understand there's some more, some more partnerships with uh, international patient groups uh, in this kidney space from around the world that will be announced. That is so important for all the right reasons and especially for data, because without that data uh, and the insights that are gained from it, uh, it's more challenging for uh, the private sector to be able to, you know, use these close collaborations. But with the data and having that every step of the way, um, innovations will really be off the charts. And uh, I'm just so in impressed with the consortium that's been created by the fact that this global conference uh, is created. When I think about w where patient engagement was, where it has been, and now uh, currently where it's going. It's just an exciting, exciting time. So uh, I'll stop there and we can have some Q&A, but I just wanna say congratulations for this kind of uh, engagement that you all are involved with globally. Thank you very much, Jack, for your comments. And let me throw a question to you. Can you tell me from your background and the many different experiences you've had on many sides of the negotiating table, what are the unique values that patients and patient insights bring to industry, in particular at a time like this, in the drive for solutions for kidney patients? What impact are they having for companies as companies are driving innovations into the consumer marketplace? Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Boy, there's, there's a lot there, and I really appreciate that. Some of these topics you and I have had a chance to talk about. So let's start with uh, industry. I think it's so important that companies that want to be competitive, whether it's in the pharmaceutical, the biological, the medical device space, really use uh, patient insight data in order to help drive uh, their decision making from the beginning through the, through the clinical trials all the way through until the end. Um, when, it comes to, um, when it comes to government authorities, whether it's NIH, whether it's FDA, Frankly, whether it's um, the folks at HHS back at the, back at the headquarters, uh, before decisions are made, 
to do what we tried so hard to do with Secretary Azar is bring patients in, bring patient groups in, just like we did with your fine organization uh, on the issue of drug pricing. You know, we spent a lot of time talking about uh, kidney health and, uh, and, and, and chronic kidney disease. Um, and that's why it, eventually the executive order was put in place and Secretary Azar's uh, efforts and Deputy Secretary Hargan, Kidney X, but even on topics that had nothing to do with the specific issue of kidney disease, we brought in patients um, in order to help to guide us. So the best example I can think of was drug pricing. And you came in and, and your president, Richard Knight, um, and really helped to better instruct us as to what were some of the biggest challenges uh, facing patients as they were hit with pretty big, uh, pretty big bills at the, at the pharmacy counter. Well, it's no surprise that when the president's blueprint for reducing drug prices, the most significant effort that's really ever been undertaken by any president of either party, uh, when it came time to unveiling that, when we had an event at the Rose Garden and then back at the HHS headquarters, who were the groups that were in the front row? I can tell you in the front row were patient organizations. And I'm so happy that AAKP could be part of that when uh, the past president and with Secretary Azar stood there and talked about, here are the initiatives that would be undertaken in order to help patients reduce their out-of-pocket expenses. You know, on the industry side, I uh, also want to talk about, you know, my time at Covidian, which was then uh, merged with uh, Medtronic. I remember back in 2000, when was it, 10, 12, uh, it was a big deal to talk about um, making the case for value and also bringing in the voice of physicians in order to better uh, instruct our innovators in how to best uh, serve providers who actually used our medical devices. Well, now, not only is that continuing to be so important, but it's so important to uh, value and to listen to those uh, patient insights and the data that is provided by a whole range of, of patient groups. Any company that wants to continue to succeed is going to weave in provider and patient voices as they're looking to develop and improve. Also, I wanted to mention that uh, when I served at FDA and we heard loud and clear uh, from various groups around different diseases, whether they were uh, some that affected the biggest percentage of our population, or frankly, whether it was some of the really terrible uh, rare diseases that impact uh, particular groups around, around the country. It's so important for uh, patients when they're coming in and talking to uh, senior leaders or mid-level leaders at, at FDA uh, to speak constructively, to be able to bring facts to the table and the stories of how lack of reimbursement and lack of approval on some of the new technologies are impacting their family lives, bring data uh, to the table, and do so outside of the typical arenas where you have patient representatives coming in that are, that are part of the existing program. It's perfectly great to be seeking your own meetings. And uh, I have found that regardless of admi administration, senior leaders want to hear from groups. Lastly, I'll say that the article that you shared with me on uh, fighting the unbearable lightness of neglecting kidney health uh, and the decade of the kidney is so, um, so important to educate me and really brought to light just how um, not enough members of the public and actually policymakers truly understand um, how many Americans and how many people around the world are impacted. Uh, dialysis and kidney transplants, I think the authors call that the tip of the iceberg. And frankly, that's what most lay people, that's what most members of the public really think about. So I think the real challenge for patient groups as I end here, and I hope I haven't gone on too long, is really to better um, help to tell policymakers just what is that overall impact um, that goes beyond what it is that most of us know, and to be able to translate that into, into terms that policymakers will understand. And then 
like we've said before, be part of the process to bring their voices and patient data every step of the way in order to help to improve patients' lives. So I really appreciate the, the question, Paul. Thank you very much, Jack, for your presentation and for answering my question. I'd like to thank all the speakers at this session today, and I hope that you look forward to the rest of the sessions today on day one. Thank you very much.